Uh, hello, Marty. Uh, we are really excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Nikita, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's great to meet you and great to, to be able to speak with, um, with your audience. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, really excited for it. Um, let's start from your background. Uh, so you did a physics degree at the Oxford University. Uh, what did the course uh, and the university, uh, what impact did they have on your career? Um, hugely formative. I fell into physics, um, you know, was reasonably good at maths, and it is just a terrific subject. It is, it is the science of how things work. And you, uh, it's all about coming up with a hypothesis and then performing experiments either to confirm or reject your hypothesis. And if your hypothesis wasn't correct, then you've got to come up with another one. You can't get dogmatic about uh, what you think should work. It either does or it doesn't. Um, and I think that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, that has been a terrific grounding, um, not only for obviously the development of, of systematic models in financial markets, but it's, it's also a good way to, to build a business. It's probably a good grounding for, I don't know, for running a country. <laughs> Hooray for the scientific method. method. M makes sense, makes sense. Um, you, you kind of uh, use this, this idea of kind of stripping out of the facts uh, and really having this um, a hypothesis driven testing, which is, I guess what you're saying that, uh, how, how the course benefited you. Um, just, just, you know, well, I'd make two observations. First of all, you know, physics is about curiosity. And I, I think that's one of the central things that, um, is important in, in financial mathematics these days. It's just to be interested, um, in things. Um, but one of the other comments is that, um, you know, at the time physics was, was very much disciplined. Um, you know, you do your solid state physics and then you do your particle physics and then you do your thermodynamics. Um, and these days, I think it's taught far more as a, you know, integrated. The, if you look at the departments in, in Oxford, there is atmospheric physics. So it combines lots of different disciplines together. And I think that's a reflection of how um, broad the topic has become and how, how everyone appreciates how much more interconnected different disciplines are. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, it cannot, uh, sorry, the the science went a long way uh, over the past uh, few decades uh, with, with the progress of computers. Um, many more things you can do uh, on your PC than on the supercomputers back in those days. Absolutely, absolutely. That that that's part of our that's part of our serendipitous story. Yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll get get into that. Uh, but uh, as you kind of uh, went through your studies uh, and uh, graduated from Oxford, uh, what what led you to uh, create uh, your first firm, uh, uh, AHL? Gosh, well, well, in between. So after after Oxford, clutching my physics degree, um, I had a choice between going to work for IBM or going to work for Nomura. Uh, and I chose Nomura because I think it was 500 pounds a year more on, on the salary. Uh, didn't know the first thing about financial markets or economics. You know, as I say, every in those days, your education was was very focused. And, uh, and I hadn't um, written an essay. You know, I'd just done physics problems, hadn't written an essay probably since I was 14 or 15. Um, but Nomura was a great experience in terms of getting me up the, the learning curve in terms of finance, economics, dealing with people. And it was a terrific opportunity to visit Japan and get uh, you know, a, a, a new cultural perspective. However, my passion was, was still in physics. During my summer vacations um, while at Oxford, I had uh, had an internship in the U.S. and I'd learned to program. I worked uh, in Fortran on this uh, enormous um, linear programming model, consulting for the for the U.S. Air Force. Um, and while working at Nomura, I ke kept having lunch and visiting my friend Mike Adam, um, who had left Oxford. He was also a physicist. Um, had gone to work for his father, 
uh, Cyril Adam ran a small commodity broking firm. They were a Mauritian family, so they were uh, intimately entwined in the sugar markets. And um, Michael had bought a small Hewlett Packard workstation and was starting to teach himself Pascal uh, and look at charting markets and testing ideas. And I was absolutely hooked. So I left Nomura after nine months, joined Mike working for his father, and together we started tinkering, completely oblivious that there was a CTA industry in the, in the US, but we um, tested a whole series of different trading models, but most of them based around chart theory. So you, know, you may have come across uh, GAN cycles or Elliott waves or, descending pennants and head and shoulders and all of these you know what sounded like folklore we condensed into um you know algorithms that we could test uh and sort of tease out whether there was systematic value um in in applying those models and we came up with a our first portfolio traded uh, you can see the commodity basis here it was cocoa coffee sugar aluminium uh, copper and zinc, I think. It was a sixth market portfolio. Uh, we persuaded Michael's father to invest £25,000 in it. Um, we, one of our metals broker at the time, I think, found a, a wealthy client who put $100,000 into it. Um, and lo, we, we were a CTA. It, it was never quite intentional, Nikita. Um, but, but that was you know, how we started managing money. And then there was just a natural curiosity. We were six markets, what about adding the seventh? What about trying a new trading model? What about trying to optimize, you know, your entry and exit points? There was that, you know, that scientific approach of, 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 of questioning and, um, and innovating and, and repeating. And, and along the way, we met uh, a fellow physicist, um, a chap called David Harding. Um, Mike and I were Oxford physicists. He was a Cambridge physicist, but we, um, we all got on. Um, and David was also fascinated by the, you know, the application of technology to markets. He was working at the time um, for a quite a, quite a well-known chartist. So a fund manager, Robin Edwards, ran his ran money for clients literally on the basis of, of reviewing the charts every day and working out what those patterns would tell him uh, and investing accordingly and david quickly saw the uh, synergies between the programming the models that michael and i were putting together if we could combine that with robin's expertise and test it we would potentially have something of enormous value um, Robin's company tried to hire Michael and me. We said, no, we work for Michael's father. So David came to work for us in the, in the Adam family business. Um, and that went on for a while, the three of us uh, researching away until there was a, a tension in 1987 and Michael's father, you know, who, who felt much more paternalistic. It was almost a family office to him while these three youngsters felt that we were on the um, on the verge of a money management firm, um, we parted. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't too big a blow up. Michael's father was supportive. We took that one $100,000 client with us. And in fact, uh, David's previous employer, uh, Robin Edwards, they were, his company was an early investor in AHL. So that's how AHL was born out of, out of the Am Adam family business. Um, and that, um, you know, and, th and from then on Nikita, um, you know, it was, it was three physicists feeling our way. Um, we didn't know there was this industry. David had more, more insight than Michael and I, and he started going to the U S where there, there was a, a, a fledgling, uh, CTA investing industry and he tells hilarious stories of going to these um, really backwater conferences uh, of the industry at the time I think it was the managed futures association it's now the managed funds association and it really was a mom-and-pop uh, organization back in back in the uh, the late 80s um, and through them uh, through that exercise we eventually met um, 
met the man group who, who took an interest in the, in the firm. But anyway, that, that's the story going from, you know, degree through Nomura, through um, the family, the Adam family business, Brockham Securities, uh, and then cleaving ourselves um, and, and starting AHL. Yeah, kind of, uh, it, it's interesting how you uh, tried a bunch of different uh, things along the way. Uh, you, you had, but kind of somewhat random uh, chances uh, kind of allowed you to pivot and navigate uh, through. Uh, who knows uh, how things would turn out, but uh, I guess uh, at, that, at, th at those times you, you were uh, quite risk tolerant and were happy to uh, try out different things, just, just uh, kind of how, how you do it in physics. You, you uh, try different things and uh, sometimes uh, some, some uh, works out uh, fairly well. And, and maybe... Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I do think you have to acknowledge a great deal of serendipity in all of the, these. You know, I, I remember vividly, um, you know, we came up one morning, we had some genius idea of how we could optimize our, our trading strategy. And we uh, looked for the perfect parameters in back test um, and then proceeded to, um, no surprise, uh, to lose a lot of money because, you know, forward-looking didn't turn out to be quite as wondrous as, as historic. Uh, and it turned out that some of the early models, Nikita, that we had developed didn't lend themselves to that kind of over-optimization. And that was, that was pure luck. You know, if you start building a moving average crossover system and, and tweaking every single parameter to perfection historically, you're, you're going to be gravely disappointed if you start trading it in real life. Uh, fortunately, and, and literally just fortunately, we didn't start there. Um, so we learned some lessons um, that uh, might have put other businesses out, uh, under, but uh, but we managed to to get through it. Yeah, uh, it it just goes to show the 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 the, the luck component of this thing. Uh, but it, it's it's quite important to acknowledge that. But at the same time, learn from the mistakes and kind of reflect as as, as you improve and and progress. And and kind of uh, speaking uh, about the AHL story. Uh, so as you said, you started with um, uh, the, the tiny uh, AUM of about 100,000, uh, even inflation adjusted, it's, 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 it's quite small, but then you, you were uh, quite, uh, the, the, this group that, that you were part of is, were just youngsters, as you say, uh, and then you, you had like terrific years uh, after that. So you grew the firm uh, from 1987, from this 100,000 uh, to over 300 million in 1994 when uh, Man Group uh, acquired um, AHL. Uh, can you just uh, tell us a bit more about this story and maybe some interesting milestones along the way? Uh, well, um, I think, so first, first of all, you know, as, as we realized that there was an industry doing this and we started to meet more brokers and agents who uh, could raise money for, for us, um, we met Man Group, and Man at the time in the late 80s had a gloriously successful business. They had a joint venture with another CTA called Mint. Um, and Mint was three individuals that had a trading algorithm that they had computerized and encoded. Um, and it was 50-50 joint venture, and Man distributed this product, and it did extremely well. Um, they, in fact, and Man took their their uh, program and embedded it in a with a zero coupon bond and it became a, a series of what were called guaranteed funds you were guaranteed to get your your principal back typically in seven years time um, interest rates were above zero in in those days um, and they were fantastically successful. So Mint, what I'm going to speculate, uh, was the first or one of the first alternative asset management firms over a billion dollars. And they were, they were at capacity. They could no longer take additional money and get their trades done. Um, so Man were looking around to um, repeat that success. And they found the three scrappy young men, uh, A, H, and L, and, um, and took a stake actually quite early on. They took a stake in our business in 1989. And um, 
had quite a hands-off relationship, but certainly focused us on the asset management because at the time we were also running a consultancy division. We were try thinking of selling our, the software that we developed to do all of these testing. You have to remember there were no tools like MATLAB. We, we built all of that, those kind of, um, you know, inquiry testing environments our, our, ourselves uh, in Pascal and later C and C++. Um, so, um, so man took a, a stake and they were curious about our approach because on the one hand, they had this very successful, uh, mint based in New Jersey, I think 24 people running over a billion dollars, just spilling off revenue for them. And then they had these three nerdy chaps with a team of about 70 at the time. Nikita, and we were, we would wax lyrical about investigating, you know, to investing in technology, investing in researchers, because you wanted to keep scratching, you wanted to improve every facet of the trading model. Can I, you know, typically in those early days, you would uh, collect the closing prices and you'd run your models overnight and you'd release them to the brokers to execute the next day. Well, kind of stands to reason why don't i snapshot the markets during the course of the day run my models as fast as i can and start trading straight away that's a obvious with hindsight but at the time it felt like a, a you know a great innovation um those were the you know could we predict volatility um you know, forward-looking volatility. Could we ha uh, get a measure of the risks that our portfolio was taking? There wasn't, there weren't concepts particularly like VAR at, at the time. So we were coming up with these um, as as we went along. And Man Group looked at us and said, "Is is this such a such an efficient use of um, uh, of capital?" But what had happened over that period from 89 to 94 was that the very successful Mint program was, uh, you know, they didn't invest in research. They had their rules set and it remained largely static and it began to perform less well. And our stream of innovation and um, refinement and improvement and expansion of the portfolio, um, actually our performance was was much more interesting. In 1994, they made us uh, an offer to buy out the remaining um, shares in, in, ASP, in AHL that we still held uh, just prior to, to the IPO. So that's kind of the, the arc of the story. And the portfolio then, you know, I talked about starting at six markets. The watersheds were 17 markets. This was still early in AHL days as we incorporated financial futures. That grew to 34. I'm not sure by the time man, um, man bought us out completely, it must have been bigger than 34. It was probably around a 66 market portfolio at, at that stage. Um, and, um, and it was a, you know, and it was a, a, it was a tense relationship because we were always trying to do new things. Um, and they were much more interested in, um, you know, I think that the, the Mint experience had been so great for so many years that they kind of wondered why we kept needing to change things. Can't you just leave it alone <laughs> and, uh, and we'll harvest what you built? And I think the evidence would now support that, you know, continual investment in, in innovation uh, and, and research is, is the only way to stay uh, uh, competitive in this space yeah it's it's, it's uh the, the the how you kind of explain it uh, here is uh, one of the uh, according to you one of the first billion dollar funds uh, extremely successful uh track record of innovation but then at some point they just uh, became i guess less nimble and wanted to preserve what what they have rather than look out for for the future and try to um adapt to it and here were you and your colleagues kind of uh, pivoting uh, right, left and center and, and getting there eventually. 
Well, you, you have to remember that, it, you know, the, er, the origins of the CTA industry were, were floor trade, largely floor traders, people who had a, a rule set that had worked very well for them. And they, the first computerized trading systems, that was literally just a way of automating um, your rule set that you had developed either, you know, John Henry was a, a floor trader, Larry Height, who was the, the you know, the principal of the Mint Group. Um, I think I think he was, uh, I wouldn't say he was a gambler, but he, you know, learned or thought of, about this algorithm from, you know, from trading the tables. Um, and then there was sort of Richard Dennis and the legendary turtle traders. These were these were steeped in you know in a market rule set it wasn't based on a, a you know a continuing research effort so actually you know i think that ahl was you know pioneered that um that approach of continuing research and then you saw this sort of wave in part the diaspora that came out of ahl but also other firms popping up for quite a while, you know, it was the European managers were the leaders of the scientific effort, and then, then certainly the the U.S. and to a smaller extent Asia um, caught up. But it was, you know, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that the early days of the CTA industry they were static models. There was no um, expectation that you needed to continue to invest to improve. Makes sense. It's yeah, but. It's it's quite logical to think that maybe it's not so homogeneous and things can evolve uh, and change quite drastically. But uh, yeah, the the this pioneering idea of of AHL that oh maybe we we would want to re refine from time to time and look out for new things it was was quite simple but uh, quite impactful at the same time. Uh, yeah, but it's ob obvious obvious in hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and and kind of uh, so the acquisition happened in 1994. Uh, I'm sure it played out uh, fairly well uh, for for the three of you. Uh, and so you you spent a, f a few more years uh, at uh, at AHL. Uh, how was that experience like? Uh, and uh, what uh, what changes did it make to your day to day? Um. We now had new masters. You know, we were very much were part of a of, we were of a division within a public company, and you know, I think what we'd seen signs of before that they weren't convinced that all of this investment in R and D was really money well spent. I think that 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 came through. So. Quite quickly after the IPO, Nikita, um, Michael Adam left the group. Um, he had other interests. He was going for, for a while into the software um, venture capital space. So he was gone. David Harding was running a separate research team in another building on the other side of London and wasn't particularly involved in the day-to-day -day of AHL and I felt that I was left a little bit holding the baby and slowly dismantling some of the the research and development teams that we put together several you know for several years beforehand you know under the under pressure from our, our new master so it wasn't particularly fun and it didn't have the the energy and the spark that uh, of, of the of the original entrepreneurial AHL so um, I, I left and took some time out took some gardening leave um, and then um, you know as, as you know together with uh, Anthony Todd and also Eugene Lambert who was part of the the um, AHL team and Michael Adam originally as as an investor because he was working somewhere else but um or he was in working in his uh software venture capital firm but he was an investor and uh, always full of good good advice and joined us again later but he, he wasn't there uh, quite on on day one the four of us had the the idea of um of of putting together aspect and what was kind of this uh, trigger if we roll back a little bit uh, so you, you took the gardening leave. Uh, what kind of made you think that, oh, I, I, I should start uh, another venture uh, and uh, to actually execute it? Well, okay. 
it, it's all connected. Uh, at, at, um, I spoke about how man had been incredibly successful with the mint funds, structuring them into this guaranteed pro product, which they could sell through a retail distribution network at phenomenal fees. Um, and it was, it was a terrific business. They did the same with the AHL program. And, and it was, you know, it was a great business for them. But we were convinced that this approach, you know, a systematic science-based um, liquid alternative investment with a with an underlying hypothesis we'll come back to to make this point but but you know that this approach that as a diversifier in institutional investors portfolio was a you know was a sitting opportunity and it was totally underexploited in those days nikita at ahl if i had picked up the phone and tried to get a meeting with with calpers they would have laughed the CTA industry was a retail business, um, and we were convinced that it we were missing an, an incredible opportunity, and that this really it needed to be in, in institutional investors' portfolios. So, in fact, Anthony Todd, who was a, a friend of uh, first Michael's and and then mine at Oxford, Anthony had uh, you know he left Oxford and worked in the, in the bond markets. He went to business school. He worked as a management consultant, and then he joined us at AHL what, to to lead that that effort to tap into you know an institutional investor we were so persuaded that this was the way forward but that immediately met resistance from our parent because they had such a you know a lucrative retail business that they had very little interest in you know using capacity at what you know institutional fees because why why should we so the genesis of, of aspect was to bring that methodology, to bring that approach, those trading ideas, that um, systematic set of strategies to an institutional audience. And that meant that, um, you know, we started writing the business plan um, early on in, where are we now, in 1997. Uh, we formed the business, we went out looking for uh, investment uh, and seed capital, and we started running money in, in 1998. And we didn't run a dollar of, of client money until we had, you know, uh, we'd rewritten, uh, we'd written the models completely from scratch. We had a dis disaster recovery facility. We had a 24 hour a day trading facility. You know, we knew that we had to have an institutional level of due diligence before we could present ourselves, um, you know, with this, this business plan. Again, many CTAs in, in those days was, you know, one individual and, and a Bloomberg screen. So this felt fairly, fairly revolutionary for our, for our industry. And the other key tenet there, Nikita, was transparency because in a retail space, you could dress this up, and we did, you could dress it up as magic, as legendary trading going on underneath the, the covers. And, uh, you know, if I explain to you how it works, I'll have to kill you. Um, and you can imagine that no institutional investor in their right mind is going to, um, is going to go for that. So we absolutely predicated the business on building a relationship with our investors and explaining to them what were the underlying drivers of our of our models and of our approach. When did we expect it to work? When did we expect it not to work? Um, and what utility it provided for their portfolios. And that's been central all the way through. That's been you know axiomatic. Right. Um, I, I, I just you know in making that point about no uh, institutional investor in their right mind should invest in something they don't understand in starting um aspect we uh we had a, an investment from rmf 
which was then a, a very successful uh, fund of funds based in Switzerland run by a, a charismatic individual, Reiner Mark Fry. And Reiner introduced us to, a, uh, to Swiss Life, the uh, investment group at Swiss Life, who became our seed lead seed investor. And, um, and it really was a good case in point. This individual was successful in his role in very large part because he had refused to invest with um, um, Meriwether, with um, uh, LTCM. And, um, you know, his colleagues in Swiss Life said, are you crazy? These are, the, these are the smartest people on Wall Street. We have to do this. And he said, if I don't understand what they're doing, I'm not going to invest in it. And, you know, that in turned out that he was the hero. So when he met us, we walked him through what we had in mind, how our strategies worked. He said, I'm, I, I'm there. Uh, and we, we set off uh, Aspect, as I say, launched the firm, launched our first fund in, in, in 1998 um, with uh, $20 million of, of seed capital. You could do that in those days. Yeah, well, wow. that, 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 that's, that's quite the story. Uh, how, how you kind of, again, um, stay true to your core values uh, and kind of uh, preserve the, the, the transparency and uh, honesty to, to the scientific rigor and like to innovation and then uh, build a, a, a firm uh, uh, based on, on those principles and use it to kind of uh, gauge the interest from the investors and build their uh, interest uh, and build a partnership around that, which is, I think, uh, how some of these uh, most successful funds uh, went on about it. Some uh, at LTCM took a little bit different approach where it was there it was more of a I think fear of missing out uh, rather than uh, I guess the, this biographs uh, and like the, the past success I spoke uh, quite loud for itself but here it was a quite quite different approach uh, from, from what, what I understand. I, yes, the, the way the way that our Swiss Life uh, colleague uh, explained it was that you know when the black limos pulled up outside, the presentation basically consisted of we all have PhDs, we're all very clever, um, and even if we explained uh, how our strategy works, you wouldn't understand it. So um, it, that that didn't work for him. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and uh, in terms of the. The AHL uh, and uh, as this was kind of the the, the kind of throughout this uh, conversation, it was uh, quite obvious the conclusion, the the pioneering and the impact that it brought to the uh, CTA industry. Uh, so, um, kind of reflecting back on the evolution of CTA, because fundamentally uh, AHL and Aspect Capital uh, are uh, in their core strategies are quite similar in the philosophy. What are some of the milestones other that you would uh, mention um, along the way of the CTA? Um, I, we've, we've, we've already talked about the sort of um, the step from, you know, trader mentality to research based um, approach. And then an interest in um, you know, investors taking interest in what were the underlying strategies. It sort of parallels the evolution of the concept of alpha, if you will, because in the investment management, um, think about it, you know, back in the 80s and before, you could be a deep value, um, large cap stock picker and describe yourself as having, you know, and pretty, you could charge pretty high fees for the alpha you were contributing to your investors' portfolios. Along came index funds and, you know, the, the, um, the that which was beta was quite quickly differentiated from that which was alpha. Um, and so it was in the CTA space. As I say, in the retail environment, the early Mint and AHL, those momentum strategies were part of the, they were alpha. Roll forward, clients, you know, academia kicks in and everyone understands 
what's under the cover. So there is a alternative beta that is the momentum factor. And, and while I would argue that not all alternative, um, you know, alternative betas are created equal, in other words, two firms that say they are momentum managers, there can be a vast difference in how you do it and the value you can generate. Um, you know, the good news is that investors took an interest in this. They were no longer prepared to invest in black boxes. They wanted to understand what the underlying drivers were. They wanted to understand what would work when, and that really played to us. That's a good conversation. The bad news is that once you understand it, you think, well, where, where's the value there? So there's been a lot of fee compression in the industry. There's been a there, you know, huge influx of competition and, and a reduction in, in fees. That's good for the investors. You know, unambiguously, that has been a, 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 a watershed. As a result, um, you know, you've seen groups investing more. You've seen groups investing more, looking to do a broader range of things to continue to add value to their investors' portfolios. So the watershed moments um, that I would draw attention to were sort of the early 2000s where, uh, or late 90s, early 2000s, where it became apparent that just trading momentum, which were predominant, the predominant approach of, of most large CTAs at the time, that no longer cut it. You weren't, you know, the return profile of a momentum, diversified momentum strategy, investors were looking for more. So managers began to diversify into other components in their business, trading a broader range of, of assets, interest rates, swaps, um, non-deliverable forward, slightly some more esoteric markets, and, and also trading a broader range of, of, of trading strategies. Some, there was a, almost a, a bit of a bifurcation in the industry. Some managers built all of those new markets and models into a flagship fund so there was a um there was an evolution or a style drift from momentum to a, a more multi-strat approach other firms and i would include aspect in this said we we're going to launch a series of programs that have different utilities, have different characteristics, and in some cases, different fee schedules, depending on their capacity. Um, and these will appeal to different investors, or some investors may want to, to combine them together. So it becomes much more of a, of a conversation of how you put those building blocks together. Um, those, are, you know, and, and the final thing I'll, I'll add to this is, you know, concomitant at the same time as, uh, investors have dug deeper and they'll no longer accept the the hand waving black box explanation you know if I explained what it was doing you'd never understand it um, you know concomitant with that has been a reduction in w what we talk about algo aversion you know there was often a feeling that well you if you're running it on a computer, surely you're going to get stuck somewhere and you need some, you know, you need a person, an experienced trader to step in and, and take the hard decisions. And we've been adamant all the way through the AHL and the aspect experience that, you know, you obviously there can be market crises where you do need to step in and, you know, there may, a market may close. So you, you need to, to take action that the model isn't prepared for. But the minute you start overriding your models, then then their value is is significantly destroyed. All of the research that went into it is significantly um, uh, destroyed. So with that rise of um, uh, you know, acceptance of, of algorithms, it's meant that the industry has kind of flipped. Whereas it felt for many years, Nikita, like I was doing missionary work to persuade people that this systematic approach was a very valuable diversifier, and they you know look at me 
slightly suspiciously, now it's completely flipped. And if you are, you know, that person with the Bloomberg screen, the investors are saying, well, where's, where are the computers? Where's your, where's your data? Where's your, uh, you know, the, the expectation is that it is science-based and that it's rooted in, in extensive technology. So if you were to kind of attribute uh, this evolution to one factor, would you say that it was really driven by investors or, or about the innovation that kind of, of the managers? Chicken and egg, but hand hand in hand. I think that, yeah, um, you know, from the early days, from the AHL days, there were, we've talked about there being an expansion of competition. So you know, a lot of smart people, as as this discipline grew up as a field of study. As I say, you know, in the early days there. You didn't have VAR metrics. You didn't have um, software to develop your trading ideas on. All of these things, you know, have evolved in in my lifetime. In fact, you, you know, you'd obviously in the early days you didn't have an internet to go and download um, data. Um, it was all pretty string and glue. In the very early days, we were even typing in hist historical prices by hand. Um, so. Uh, you know, that co competition has spurred everyone to innovate. So it's made the range of programs um, more interesting, I think, to investors. And that's bought, that's bought in investor interest. So it's, it's been a, a symbiotic relationship. Um, it, of course, it's, you know, um, it, it's best when there's a deep relationship because on the one hand lower fees are very much in in the investors interests and i and i get that and that's that's why we exist you know that's the obviously there's an intellectual passion in building models in building a, a business but at the end of the day our utility is in adding value to investors portfolios whether they're sovereign wealth or state pension schemes or uh, re retirement programs or in australia all around the world you know that's that's where we that's where we earn our bread and butter nikita so but finding the right balance with your investor between fees that work for their clients and paying for that research and that innovation you know that's um that's the sign of a good relationship makes sense makes sense and and speaking about research this was uh, obviously like a, a big uh, topic uh, throughout our conversation uh what is the develop the recent development uh that that you are particularly excited about in in the space um well aspect now has a a, a whole series of different research teams that all collaborate together but they're working on their focus is on different capabilities so we've got our um our long-term risk premia team who are you know these are uh, they've been working on the momentum models on carry models on value models on portfolio construction for many many years um, and there they use enormous amounts of data and have very high um, hurdles of um, of statistical um, you know they have to be satisfied before they will um, to a high level of rigor before they will make uh, changes in, in in the model structure and those models are all predicated on what we think are long-term um, you know systematic or, or, or almost uh, behavioral effects um, so you there's an underlying driver to all of these models that would take an enormous amount of evidence for us to believe that that um, underlying factor underlying driver has gone away other teams within the research effort for example our systematic global macro team or our short-term trading team are looking for if I say transient, that doesn't mean good today, gone tomorrow, but the systematic global macro team are looking from a more top down. What factors are driving the economy? 
are driving flows and those change over time and they that team acknowledges that they change over time so they're constantly looking to innovate with new models sometimes they'll get rid of old models and interestingly they will novate their models so the example that i'm where i'm going with this is to highlight you know there's a lot of hype associated with alternative data sets and you know when people start waving their arms or journalists write about this they're talking about satellite telemetry data and credit card data and and that's interesting and it's it's a rich seam and and you know it's great but you can get lost in the noise so it does take a judicious um you know focus to be able to pick out what's useful to you and what isn't but i would highlight that what this foray into the alternative data space gives us is much more timely information so you can t if you have designed a mod for example a model of of uh, of fx flows that that is a reflection of relative gdps you know that model could have worked very well developed in the 80s or 90s based on metrics of GDP that are backward looking and that you collect once a week, once a month, you know, um, once a quarter. They're not so much used to you. You know, you, my understanding is that models that use backward looking um, analysis to identify regimes really struggled in March of this year as, as the world changed on a dime due to the, uh, the corona, uh, coronavirus. Alternative data gives you the opportunity to have forward-looking data. So you can, uh, we found sources of data that are essentially proxies, for example, for a GDP, but on a forward-looking and much more dynamic basis. And suddenly what may have looked like a model that had lost its mojo is very valuable to you once again. So I, that's, sorry, Nikita, a long-winded answer, but I would highlight the rich new sets of data that are available to us now. And everyone talks about um, the internet of things and how many you know zettabytes of data are being created every nanosecond. It's all yeah. a bit hyper, hyperbolic, but in there, there's a lot of interesting stuff that, um, that we are researching and 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 our and our peers are researching so it's data um, data data and data 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 and lots of uh, lots of interesting tools uh, to play with uh, to extract the the information which weren't available back then maybe yeah. the maybe the data wasn't really created as such but that that existed was a bit more challenging to play with and plot some more or you create some more sophisticated models Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the irony is that in the early days, data was considered, um, you know, it was throwaway. It was, you know, the exchanges had no interest in collecting or selling their data. It was, you know, and, and, and at, in the early AHL, we were just voracious. We had disks piled up everywhere because we would, we would collect everything. And, you know, since then the penny has dropped and, the, the, and, and I don't know what the stats are, but I can imagine that a large portion of the CMEs or the exchanges revenues are generated by, by selling their data. So um, it's, it's, it's become a more nuanced, competitive uh, and, and interesting landscape. Yeah, and the, the barriers of entry now are climbing higher and higher as a result of that. But uh, I think we can go um, a, a lot longer on this topic of data, but uh, let's just maybe wrap it up with the, with the final question. Uh, we'll always ask our guests uh, for three pieces of advice uh, they would give uh, to their younger self. What would be yours? Gosh, three. Do I have to do three? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, so I, I, I will say curiosity again. Um, that you know, I think I got into physics, but I think that that uh, you know, as a result of of being curious by nature, what I would tell my younger self is be curious about a broader range of things because you know, then 
I, I talked about physics feeling like a fairly silo discipline. And there was also a mentality that the great physicists were, were lone wolves. Think about Newton, think about Einstein, think about Feynman, you know, these were individuals that would, you know, sit in, or sit in a room and come, come up with some genius insight. Look at physics today, just as an example, and it's a discipline of collaboration. Of course, there are some superstars in, in the discipline, but you know the heroic um, identifying the, the the Higgs boson at CERN were there were two independent research teams, the Atlas and the CMS team, and hundreds and hundreds of people collaborated over many years to get the results that when they put them together, they had in, incontrovertible controvertible evidence of the existence of this particle that speaks to you know be curious and collaborate so may maybe i was a little bit curious in in narrow places and the and the wider you are the in your in your breadth you know it's funny how things in, in interact so so curiosity collaboration the the networking that you do uh, at college or in your early career you know it's not a waste of time um you know you come up with better ideas if you are working with other people rather than locking yourself in in the library let me assure you um working with a, as diverse a group as possible also diversity of of thought a background is is key to coming up with with um with better ideas i've learned um so i would um, I would tell my young self that um, and also you know sharing problems because if you try and solve everything from first principles yourselves well maybe you look like a hero but that's hard miles if you can put together a group of people who with uh, with complementary expertise you can make much faster progress um, so what have, I, what have I talked about curiosity collaborate you know be curious and be curious more broadly collaborate network connect yourself with a diverse group of of, of people um and interconnectedness remember things that aren't obviously interconnected they really are so you know um before 1987 before the the uh, that stock market crash you know portfolio insurance looked like a genius idea the fact that you could sell uh stock index futures as the market fell and that would protect your portfolio brilliant idea until you figure out that everyone's doing the same thing and that interconnectedness creates a sort of death spiral in the markets um you've got to uh, the, the the quant quake of 2007 every all model builders were were thinking that what they were doing was in isolation but the follow the carry on effect of a collective group of those actually meant that what a competitor's models, you know, they had an impact on your models and you had to consider the whole system rather than just yours in, in isolation. Those are some of the, the things that I, that I would emphasize. Yeah, my, my, my makes sense. And lots of uh, good, good things that to think about and lots of, uh, inspirational ideas to, to digest uh, and to start to apply to, to the day-to-day -day life. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for doing this. It's been a great pleasure uh, and very informative conversation. Thank you. My pleasure, Nikita. Thank you very much for the time.